Hey everybody, John Isley here. Welcome to Woodwind Fest. I'd like to say a huge thank you to BK, Sean, Sarah, and all the rest of the gang who made this possible. It was a huge undertaking, an investment of time, resources, planning, scheduling, you name it, and I think they did a wonderful job. So thank you, and thank you for having me.
spend a large amount of my time as a saxophone player in the studio, but also as an arranger, producer, composer, and engineer. One of the questions I get a lot is, how do you get a good sound at home? How do you record well at home? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about right now. So your first consideration when you're recording at home is you need a microphone. While you can record directly into your iPhone or your iPad or your laptop microphone, it's not gonna cut it for quality work. You need something to record that's going to capture a quality representation of your sound. Now, you can spend a couple of hundred bucks on a USB microphone that plugs directly into your computer. You can spend several thousand dollars on high-end boutique microphones and everything in between. You just need to get something that is within your budget, number one, and number two, has a reputation for reasonable quality. Spend some time online researching, reading forums, talking to people like myself. We'll give you plenty of recommendations for affordable microphones within your budget. The second thing that you need is some sort of audio interface to get that sound, to get that microphone signal into your computer. Again, you can spend a few hundred dollars, you can spend several thousand dollars. There is a wide range of possibilities there. Again, like with the microphone, what's important is that you find something that's within your budget, but that is also reputable and has quality sound. That's not impossible to find. Now, let's assume you have your microphone, you have your audio interface, you have it hooked up to your computer, and your DAW, whether it's GarageBand, Logic, Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Cubase, you name it, it's all the same ones and zeros, it all has a record button. Let's assume that that's all set up and it's all working. So the next thing you need is a space to record in. Now, most of us who are recording at home, myself included, are recording in a spare bedroom. This room is a second bedroom in my apartment in New York City. It is not acoustically treated, and while that has its own set of issues, it's not insurmountable. And it's the space that I have, so it's the space that I work with. Now, what's important is that in your space, whatever your space may be, that you spend some time learning what sounds good in that space and precisely where things sound good in that space. Now you can walk around your room and you can clap, or you can sing, or you can whistle, you can whatever you like, or play your horn. And when you find the spot in the room that to your ear sounds the best, well, guess what? That's where your microphone goes because all in all, a microphone is an ear. Just like you have ears, the microphone's an ear. It's listening for sound. And if your ear says that this spot in the room is the best sounding spot in the room, well, that's a pretty good idea. That's where you should put your microphone. Placing your microphone in that space ensures that you're going to capture the highest quality sound you can get in that particular room, in that space. You generally want to avoid being near a wall or near windows because sound reflects off of hard surfaces and reflects back into the microphone, and that creates another set of issues. But if you're in the middle of the room or middle-ish of the room, you should be just fine. Now, let's talk about proximity. A lot of people think that the saxophone, that all the sound on the saxophone comes out of the bell. That is not the case. Generally speaking, the sound from the saxophone comes from the upper third of the instrument. 
basically down to the left, to the bottom of the left-hand stack and the bell. You know, the instrument itself radiates sound energy all over, but the majority of the sound is coming from up here. Now, that being said, if you are setting up your microphone to record saxophone, then you're going to want the diaphragm on the microphone to be pointing basically at your third finger, at your ring finger on your left hand. And that's going to be basically right here between the bell and the, and the left hand stack. And furthermore, you want to be about six to eight inches away from the diaphragm of the microphone. Now, why? Why is that? A lot of times you'll see guys like on videos and TV shows and whatever, they'll have the microphone buried in the bell. Well, that's a choice, and it's also a particular sound. However, for studio recording, it's not a really good idea. And the reason is something called proximity effect. The microphone like this, which is a condenser microphone, it has an effect called the proximity effect, which basically the closer to the microphone you get, the more low frequency energy is captured, the more low end you're gonna get in your sound. Now I'm gonna play a note and I'm gonna close in and back off from the microphone and you'll be able to hear the low end energy coming in and out of that sound. <laughs> You can also hear it getting slightly louder as you approach the microphone because you're getting closer to the ear. But if you listen carefully, you can hear that there is more low end energy being captured as the horn gets closer to the microphone. Now, what does this mean? What this means is that you should spend some time recording yourself and playing with distance from the microphone, finding the spot that sounds the best to your ear. There is no particular right or wrong here. What is right is what sounds right to you. Whatever that sound is, that's the sound that you're going for. That's the sound that you want to capture. So for argument's sake, we've captured a good sound. Now what do you do with it? So I'm going to play a little something, and then we're going to go over and we're going to talk about EQ and effects and what that means for the sound of saxophone. <laughs> talk about effects. So here we're going to go over to Logic. Now this will hold true for pretty much any DAW. As a matter of fact, it will hold true for any audio workstation, whether it's Pro Tools, Logic, Ableton Live, uh, Cubase, whether you're working on a Mac, you're working on Windows, it doesn't matter. It's all the same ones and zeros. They all function basically the same. But I'm working in Logic. It's my DAW of choice. So I'm going to play the clip for you. Here's what we just recorded. OK, doesn't sound bad but there is room for improvement. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab uh, this little EQ, this little Logic EQ here, and we're gonna take a look at what's happening in the spectrum. Now one of the great things about a uh, visual EQ like this is you can visually inspect and see what's going on. Now I've already dialed in a couple of things here, but I'm gonna explain to you what I've done. So this is flat with no EQ. This is the EQ off. <laughs> I'm going to turn the EQ on, but I'm going to turn my changes off, and now you can see what happens. So you see all of the energy happening right in here, between 2 and 500, and then up around 2 or 3K, somewhere in there. 
Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a high-pass filter. What is a high-pass filter? A high-pass filter lets high frequencies through and blocks low frequencies. Now, you can see that there is some energy happening right down here in the very low sub-frequencies. Now, the tenor saxophone, the bottom note on the tenor saxophone is a B-flat. is a concert A-flat 1. So that's not uh, particularly low uh, in the frequency spectrum. And the fact of the matter is, is that you can high pass this somewhere up around 100, maybe 125 without any real detriment to the sound. The easiest way to figure this out, however, is to play and drag that frequency. <laughs> Now, as I drag the frequency higher, you hear that the sound gets thinner and thinner. But as I get back to somewhere, right along in this area, it's not really having an effect on the overall sound, but it's cleaning up any noise or mud or anything of that type that might be happening uh, in the low frequency spectrum. Now the other thing that I'm hearing when I'm listening to this is I'm hearing a little bit of the boxiness of my room. My, re my recording space is a little boxy. Um, it's a little funky in the low mid area. Now that would be somewhere in the 300 to 500 range and I'm gonna do the same thing which is I'm going to grab a frequency over here and I'm gonna drag it up and down until I find the offending uh, sound. <laughs> Somewhere right in there. That seems to sound better to me. It's just taking out a little bit of that funky boxiness right there. Now, the presence band for, you know, a track, articulation, things like that, it's going to be somewhere in the 1 to 2K range up in there. And we're going to go in there and listen to that a little bit, too. thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go up on the very, very top here and put in a low pass filter, which is the opposite of a high pass filter, which allows all of the low frequencies below this band to pass through and attenuates everything above it. And this is up about 17k. Uh, and this is just to take any kind of hiss or um, any kind of super high, weird, strange harmonics and get them out of the sound. <laughs> Okay, now this is where we were. This is where we are. Without. With. It's very subtle. I'm just pulling out a little bit that sort of boxiness right here. And just giving a little bump to the attack. Okay, then the next thing we're going to move on to is we're going to talk about compression. As a general rule, I don't like to use a lot of compression. But in modern recording, it is 
a absolute necessity. So we're going to go with this Studio FET uh, processor, which is very similar to an 1176 uh, Universal Audio or a URI. Um, and we're going to set our threshold is going to be our primary control. We're going to set a ratio at 2 to 1. Um, our makeup gain at zero at the moment, and our attack is going to be fairly fast, and our release is going to be fairly fast. We don't want this clamping down and holding on. We want it to just take a little off the top and let go. Um, and you're going to see that the uh, gain reduction is going to be in the 2 dB range. It's just pulling a little bit off of the attack. <laughs> Now, if I drop the threshold, notice that it's taking a lot more of that signal away, and it's seriously flattening out the dynamics. Now again, this is all dependent upon program. It really depends on what you're mixing and where you're mixing it to. But these are basic tools that you will use to fit this into a track. Next up, let's talk about reverb. So for reverb, I am going to use a basic space designer. Um, this is a reverb that comes with Logic. Um, you can use any basic reverb that you have access to. I'm not using any specialized plugins specifically because this applies across the board. Um, I have brought up a plate reverb. Plate reverbs tend to work very, very well with horns, saxophones, trumpets, uh, horn sections. Um, they tend to have a really, really nice sound with horns. Something about the metallicness of it seems to ring very nicely with uh, saxophones. Now, I am setting this up so that it has a slight pre-delay. Now, what is pre-delay? Pre-delay is the time it takes from the initial sound before the reverb kicks in. So pre-delay, instead of sounding like it's in a wash, by pre-delaying it by a few milliseconds, makes it seem like the source is closer to you and the reverb is behind. At least that's the way it works to my ears. So it doesn't sound like the instrument is in the midst of the reverb. It sounds like it's in front of the reverb, and the reverb is blooming behind it to me. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to play this, and we're going to dial in a little reverb. Now, one of the things that I did ahead of time was I put an EQ in front of the reverb. And why would I want to do this? Well, one of the reasons I want to do this is I am cutting out all of the low-frequency information up to about 432 hertz or so, four or 500 hertz. And I'm taking all of the high-end information down to 2,500 hertz or so, 2.5K. And I got a little tiny bump at about 1K in here. What this is doing is this is making sure that the reverb is only triggered by the mid-range. It's triggered by the range of our hearing that is the most prominent. So it's not going to have a lot of glassy highs flying around up there, and it's not going to have a lot of mud coming out of the low end. This is going to make the reverb very uh, focused and very compact. And that's going into our reverb. And now we're going to dial the saxophone in. Now 
I'll turn the EQ off. So hopefully you can hear how having this EQ in front of the reverb clarifies the reverb. There's not as much mud and as much dirt floating around in there. So the reverb is much clearer and much cleaner and allows the sound of the saxophone to come through more than all of the extra muck that's happening around it. Last thing I want to talk about is delay. So this is these are the most common types of effects that you will find on the saxophone uh, in a mix would be delay and reverb. There are other things that you can use, chorusing, uh, envelope filters, things like that. But in basic saxophone recording, you're looking at reverb and delay and EQ and compression. Those four things. Those are the four primary things. So now we're going to look at a basic tape delay. Now again, I'm setting all of these up as bus effects. They are not actually directly on the saxophone track. I am bussing a uh, percentage of the sound to it. If you don't understand what that is, good Google search will uh, clue you into that. Um, so the delay I have set up right now is set time to an eighth note at 120. Doesn't really matter because this should not be tempo synced. Uh, because there is no tempo involved here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to dial in a little of this delay, and then I'm going to play with the delay time to find what I think is appeasing. <laughs> And again, it's all according to taste. It's according to what sounds right to you and what you are looking for in your production or in your final mix. So that's pretty much it. I hope you found this useful. I hope you found it interesting. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me through my website. I'll be more than happy to try to help you along your journey. Be safe. Be well. Happy Woodwind Festing.